Hi, I'm Gianluca Garofalo from the DLR, the German Aerospace Center. In this video, recorded for IROS 2020, I will present our recent results on hierarchical tracking control. I will also show you how the methodology developed in this work can be used in order to obtain a novel approach towards singularity handling and how it can be applied to trajectory tracking on submanifolds. I've organized this video presentation in five parts. I will start by showing a few slides that we set the basics for our further discussion. Then I will explain why it is important to introduce the new methodology. The following part will present more details on the controller design. And later I will also show you some examples in which the derived control law has been applied. And finally, I will summarize the work and give some hints for future works. Without going into the details of any specific control law, it is quite common that the control action consists in a spring damper force that pulls the robot towards the goal. Although the robot configuration is defined by the joint coordinates Q, depending on the specific task that the robot has to execute, it might be more useful to use different coordinates. For example, if the hand of the robot is requested to move in the Cartesian space, it is very useful to use Cartesian coordinates for the task. Something that is then important to highlight is the fact that in order to perform this coordinate transformation from the joint coordinates to the Cartesian coordinates, one needs the inverse of the Jacobian matrix. This figure is something that you very likely will find in many books about differential geometry. What it says is that if we have a manifold Q, we can assign coordinates to the manifold, but likely these coordinates will not hold globally, but just in a subset of the manifold. What we can do though is to cover the whole manifold with multiple subsets and coordinates for each one of them. This is exactly what happens in our case when we assign Cartesian coordinates, for example, to the manifold given by the configuration space of the robot. Keeping the picture in mind, the following three topics often addressed within the robotics community can be shown to be all tackled by the methodology that I will present in the next slides. To already give you an idea of what I'm about to present you, I want to focus our attention for a second on this example. What we see in plot A in blue is a two-link planar robot and what we want to achieve is tracking the trajectory in orange. The arc part of this trajectory is exactly at the boundary of the workspace of the robot, meaning that the robot would be completely stretched to follow that path. Therefore, if we use Cartesian coordinates, the robot will be singular when completely stretched. As a consequence, what we see in figure B is a typical behavior of a control action that uses the inverse of the Jacobian. As soon as the robot starts being too close to singularity, the control torque will grow very large and the execution has to be stopped. In the plot C and D instead, we see two incremental improvements that can be obtained with the control law that I'm proposing here. In figure C, we see that the first part of the trajectory can be indeed tracked, and that's because the control law is well behaved even when in singularity. Nevertheless, the last part of the trajectory cannot be executed. And that's because at that point, the robot is fully stretched and the Cartesian force that the controller wants to realize is completely aligned with the robot itself. This means that at that point, the use of Cartesian coordinates is basically a bad choice. In plot D instead, the robot is not using just Cartesian coordinates in order to perform the task, but also joint coordinates. And this is what actually allows the robot to continue to track the trajectory, even if at some point the Cartesian coordinates fail to be a good description for the task. The idea is then that singularities can be handled as if we would have multiple tasks one task for each set of coordinates that we want to use. 
with the coordinates preferred for the task having a higher priority over the other coordinates. The title of this slide might sound strange, but the message is that the singularities are actually more of consequence of our bad choices for coordinates, rather there's something connected to the task that we want to execute. For example, in the previous case, we were able to continue tracking the trajectory by simply using a different set of coordinates when the Cartesian ones fail to be a good description. So the problem is that when we design our control law, we commit to use just one set of coordinates. And the typical solution in order to avoid singularity is basically to just push the robot away for those regions in which the coordinates that we chose just do not hold. If instead we recall the picture that we saw before about the charts, the paradigm that I'm trying to propose here is to rather use multiple sets of coordinates in such a way that we can globally cover the workspace and having the controller automatically select the appropriate sets of coordinates. To be a bit more formal, given the robot dynamics, we will have our tasks xi with their derivatives xi dot. The tasks are also ordered according to their priority. So the task x1 will be the one with the highest priority. Each of them will have a certain dimension mi, and the total task dimension given by the sum of all these mi's is assumed to be bigger or equal than the number of degrees of freedom of the robot. This assumption is weaker than the one typically used, since usually m is assumed to be equal to n. This is a quite important point, because as we were mentioning before, this allows the tasks not only to be actual different things that the robot has to execute, but also different description of a same task using different coordinates. If any of the task with a higher priority becomes at a certain point singular, a task with a lower priority is allowed to take over the free degrees of freedom. This concept can be easily seen from a mathematical point of view when we consider the dynamically consistent Jacobian matrices. The Jacobian matrix of each task gets modified by taking into account in an iterative procedure the null space projector of the task with the higher priority. And singularities in a task will result in a change in its correspondent null space projector. The second assumption that needs to be made is that the rank of the Jacobian matrix J bar, given by stacking together all the J bar i's, is full rank. This is actually what allows us later on to perform the coordinate transformation that we need. An easy way to satisfy both assumption 1 and assumption 2 is to always consider a joint configuration task. This is exactly what we did before in our planner example, where we used both Cartesian coordinates and joint space coordinates. The velocities corresponding to the new Jacobian matrix J bar are indicated by V, and the relationship between the joint space velocity and the two different task velocities are described in uh, these two equations. What is important is that there is a unique correspondence between V and X dot, and that's because the matrix T is invertible, and in particular, it is lower block triangular with identities on the diagonal. And this is quite important for the stability analysis. Using the velocity mappings, the dynamic model of the robot can be written in terms of the velocity v. At this point, it's also clear why it was convenient to use the velocity p rather than x dot. In fact, since each of the j bar was computed in the iterative procedure using the weighted Moore-Penrose inverse, the transformed inertia matrix lambda is block diagonal. Moreover, the Corioni matrix gamma can be written as the sum of two terms, one block diagonal and one which is a skew-symmetric matrix. And it can be proved that the derivative of the inertia matrix lambda can be written in terms of the term gamma d. Once again, this is a very important property that is exploited in the stability analysis carried on in the paper. At this point, in the spirit of the Slotin and Lee control law, 
one has to define the reference velocity vr and the sliding variable s, where the main difference is that we use the velocity v rather than the velocity x dot. Those of you familiar with the slot in the controller will recognize that actually the torque tau is very similar to the usual control law that one writes down in the slot in any case. The main difference here is that the matrices that appear, so both the Jacobian J-bar and the transformed inertia and Coriolis matrix, have the dimension of the tasks, so are bigger matrices compared to the degrees of freedom of the robot. Finally, the triangular structure of the matrix T is an indication of the fact that a certain task is only affected by those with a higher priority. If we now go back to our initial example, what we have there is that by using both Cartesian and joint coordinates, when the Cartesian coordinates are not singular, the projection of the joint task via the null space of the Cartesian task leads to a matrix of zeros, and therefore the joint task is providing no contribution. But this is not the case when the Cartesian task is singular. Now, in this example, we have a 7 off robot, but the total task dimension is 17. As in the previous example, the last task, x7, is a joint configuration task. The first two tasks instead, x1 and x2, are orientation tasks. They use two different sets of error angles in order to describe the orientation. The first set, zyz, has a singularity when the second angle is zero, while the other set, xyz, has a, sing a singularity when the second angle is 90 degrees. Since in this example, I would like to show you how we can use this methodology in order to track a trajectory on a submanifold, I'm considering for the position of the end effector the task of moving along a circle. In particular, the task x3 defines the circle itself, while x4 and x5 determine the position of the end effector along the circle as time goes on. Finally, x6 gives us the height of the end effector while the task is executed. The point here is that the circle is the most simple submanifold that we can imagine, and the way we can describe it is only by using multiple charts. One possible choice for the charts is to use the colored arcs that you see in the figure. With x4 and x5, we are either expressing the position along the circle as a function of x or as a function of y. Obviously, the robot is able to track the desired values, as we can see both by looking at three of the 17 signals and to the norm of the orientation, position, and configuration error. One thing that I would like to highlight is the fact that the second of the error angles has a desired value that attains both the value 0 and 90 degrees. Therefore, it would have not been possible to use just one single set of error angles in order to track the desired values, because we would have inevitably have a singularity. So to summarize, the key points are two. First, the fact that the total task dimension is now not limited anymore to be equal to the numbers of degrees of freedom of the robot. And secondly, the fact that by using weighted moore penrose inverses, we can have a solution that is well-behaved even in presence of singularities, but still retains all the property that we are used to have when we consider the inverse of the Jacobian matrix. Thanks to these two properties, singularities can now be handled in a way that is different to the classic approach. In particular, the idea is to use as many charts as possible in order to obtain a global description of the workspace. The same idea can also be used in order to track trajectory on some manifold, where once again the idea is to use as many charts as possible in order to obtain a global description of the submanifold. The control scheme that has been used is based on the Slotin and Lee control law, which simplifies a lot the proof and most importantly suggests possible adaptive extensions. Finally, what I think is the important take-home message after this presentation is that using a redundant task description can make the use of the robot much simple, since, for example, we don't have to worry anymore about singularities. With this, I thank you very much for your attention, 
And please do not hesitate to contact me in case you would like to discuss more about this or have any kind of question.